But today we're continuing the book of Habakkuk in part three. And we'll be reading from chapter three of this great book. I hope that you've enjoyed these, these conversations that we've been eavesdropping in on as we've seen the, the prophet Habakkuk speaking with our God. You know, it's, it's just been so real, so down to earth as we see Habakkuk grieving over the condition of his nation. You know, he's at the point where he's just, he's just sick and tired of all the sin. He's seen the suffering, the evil, the injustice of it all. And I was, I was thinking this morning, you know, if he lived in our day, if he lived in our day, he would probably sue for the emotional trauma that they'd inflicted upon him. You know, I mean, he, he's, he's broken. And there, there are people today that, that claim that emotional trauma today because of, of, you know, what the Bible does and what Christians do to them today. But, but anyway, you know, just that's off, off, off the chart. But anyway, he's frustrated. And he brings his request to God. And he's going to get back in the zone. And that's, that's a good place to go when, when things aren't going the way you thought they should go. You know, when, when, you, when you've confirmed what you believe to be the will of God, and you ask God, aren't you getting tired of this too? God, what are you going to do about this? And so here we find that God answers Habakkuk, and he, and he says, I've got a plan. He says, you, you know those nasty and wicked people that live next door. You know those people, right? Those na nasty and wicked people that live next door. <clears throat> those people called the Babylonians. Well, they've been wanting to attack you for a long time, and I've been protecting you. But now your people keep sinning. They're rebellious. They're disobedient. So I'm going to let them do what they want. Now, of course, Habakkuk didn't, didn't like what he heard. So he's like, isn't, isn't there a plan B? Can't, can't we work this out another way? But if you remember, God had told him in chapter 2, I've, I've given them plenty of time to repent of their sins and return to me. But you just need to trust me. Trust me because I'm a good God. And I know what I'm doing. Just watch and wait. And so Habakkuk does. He trusts God, and he goes to that quiet place. He stands at his watch. He stations himself on the ramparts. And in solitude, he draws near to God and watches God work. Now, the result of this time of prayer and meditation was, was a song, like an opera. And that's what we find here in chapter 3. Habakkuk is inspired to write this song of worship and praise. And the first thing we're going to see is that he remembers what God has done. So let's pray together, and then we'll read and get into the Word of God today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your Word. We thank you that as we, as we study, Lord, that it's you and you alone that would give us the eyes to see. It's you that would give us a mind to comprehend and a heart to receive the truth of Scripture. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us the humility of Jesus and the love of the Holy Spirit so that we might be unified around the fact that you do love us and that we love you and that we love each other. And so as we read today, I ask that the Holy Spirit would enlighten us so that we might love as you've loved us. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we ask these things. Amen. All right, so Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. It begins like this. It says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigni... I'm not even good there. <laughs> Lord, I, I've heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. <clears throat> in wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the, the Holy One from the Mount of Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. 
plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Cushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Why are you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses in your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath, you strode through the earth, and in anger, you thrust the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leaders of the land with, of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as, as about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waves. All right, let's, let's pause right there before I get too far ahead of myself. What we see here is Habakkuk remembers what God has done. He looks back and remembers the faithfulness, the character, and the goodness of God. He's like, I've, I've read these things, but I've never seen them. In my day, people sin, and there is no justice. Habakkuk says, in my day, the wicked prosper, and the, and the righteous are suffering. So he remembers the goodness and the glory of God. He remembers a day when the people of God were in, in the zone. You know, when everything seemed to go their way. You know, they, they would mess up and, and God would jump right up and he'd fix things for them. And maybe, maybe you know people like that. You know, everything seems to go their way. Every, every team they root for wins a championship. Every, every goal they set is realized. Their kids come home with stray days. And when they drop a piece of bread, it always lands butter side up. You know, you know what I mean? But this morning, maybe your experience is more like Habakkuk's. You know, you've read the Bible, and you see God showing up in amazing ways, and you wonder, how come I've never seen that? How come I've never seen a miracle, never seen a revival? How come it is that I've never seen God's just judgment on a godless nation? You know, God, I, I've never seen a plague, never seen the sea part, never seen anybody walk on water. And so Habakkuk says, I've read about these things, but I've never seen them. And so maybe like Habakkuk, your team didn't win the championship. In fact, the coach just got fired. Your kids didn't come home with stray days, but he came home with attention. Your, your boss didn't offer to give you a raise, but instead he said, don't bother taking your coat off. You see, that's what it's like to be out of the zone. And that's where Habakkuk found himself. You know, it's, it's a life that's best described by the song they used to sing on Hee Haw. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. <clears throat> have you ever felt that way? You know, it, like, it's, it's just your, 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 your lot in life. All there is is bad luck. There's always that storm cloud over your head. You constantly find yourself living in lack. You're always the underachiever, always getting the bad break. And, you know, there, there's nothing funny about that. Because it's like every, every day you're going through the fire. There's, there's nothing funny about that because it's like you're being beat down by life. And so you, it's like you're going months without closing a deal, weeks without ever making a sale. And you're wondering if your best days are behind you. 
if God has forgotten who you are or maybe even where you live. But if that's you today, I, let me assure you that you're not the first person or even the first believer who had these feelings. Even King David, who was described as a man who was after God's own heart, a man with an anointing, a man with a calling on his life, even David cried out in the Psalms and said, How long, O Lord? He knew what it was like to find himself out of the zone and walking through the fire. In Psalms 44, he cried out to God and he said, My disgrace is before me all day long, and my face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and revile me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge. All this happened to us. Though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant, our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. In other words, David says, times are tough. And we didn't do anything to deserve this. But it just came out of the blue. Now Habakkuk, on the other hand, he speaks of, of, of the trouble that Israel endured. Because of their rebellion against the ways of God. You see, they had strayed from God. They had walked away. And they were facing the inevitable consequences of their behavior. But you know, sometimes life's most difficult seasons aren't correction. They're preparation. And what we learn from Habakkuk is to accept what God is doing. Now that doesn't mean that you just roll over and play dead. That, that, that doesn't mean that you don't pray for a miracle. But what that means is that it's time to acknowledge the truth. Or maybe if God has spoken directly to you as he did with Habakkuk, then you accept what God has said. Sometimes it's as, it's as simple as trusting in the knowledge, the presence, and the power of our sovereign God. So if the doctor says that your health is not very good, then you need to make some changes. You embrace the truth. When your marriage is in trouble and your spouse says, we need counseling, you go and you work it out. Sometimes when finances are bad, you don't, you, you don't buy that new car. You don't go out and buy that new house, but you get a second job and you save. <clears throat> you see, when you see the storm coming, you face the truth. And here's the amazing thing about how God sometimes works in our lives. We see this in the book of Habakkuk. When there's true repentance, correction becomes re preparation. And sometimes it's necessary for God to pull back and allow us to reap the spiritual consequences of our behavior. And so when that happens, we have the choice to resist God's correction, to stay out of the zone and to continue in the flesh. Or we can surrender to what God is telling us to do. We can turn to him in repentance and receive his correction. It's then that we find ourselves opening the door to, as God begins to prepare us for something bigger and better in our Christian lives. You see, what we need to understand is that even though at times it may be necessary for God to correct us, our relationship with God is not about judgment. It's not about punishment but it's about transformation. And so here what Habakkuk experiences, what happens to Habakkuk is he's waiting and he's watching. He's in that place of solitude. He's drawing near to God. And he has this physical reaction, which he explains in verse 16. I heard and my heart pounded, he said. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my lips, my legs trembled. <clears throat> Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. You see, he's like, God, I can't, I can't wait. <clears throat> I can't wait to see you show up and to do what you do best, to deal with sin and to, and to save your people. He says, I'm so excited that my heart is pounding. 
My lips are quivering and my, and my legs are trembling. Habakkuk's overcome with, with anticipation. He's terrified, and yet at the same time, he says, yet yeah, I'll wait patiently for the day of calamity. And you know the reality is that sometimes things happen that we don't like, and we need to accept it. Sometimes when you feel like you're, you're living your life out of the zone, when everything seems to be ten times more difficult than it should be. And when God's blessing is just out of your reach. You need to remember what God has done. Accept what God is doing. And then third, now here's, here's the power behind Habakkuk's song. you got to trust what God is going to do. Let's look at the last verses of this book. These are some of the most moving and powerful words in all of Scripture. If, if, you're, if you're going through a difficult season right now, here's a principle that will help you move from out of the zone back into the zone. To move from the desert to the oasis, from, from the fire to a life of freedom and victory. Let's read verse, at verse 17. I don't know what happened to verse 17. <laughs> There it is. <laughs> Praise God. You know, lucky I'm not that slow. It says, though, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the, and the fields produce no fruit, though there are no, no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. One simple word spoken from the prophet is the clue to the power behind this chapter. And that word is yet. It can be translated nevertheless or even still. And it's the ability to walk through life victoriously, to experience success in the Christian life, to, to get back in the zone and to live as an overcomer. And it all rests on this one word, yet. Habakkuk says that, that even though he has no reason to rejoice, even though the fig tree doesn't bud, yet I will rejoice in my God. Even though there are no cattle in the barn, yet I will rejoice in my God. You see, even though they're the very things that you've been praying for, even though those things you've been anticipating, longing and yearning for, do not come to pass. <coughs> even though you're alone, you're sick, you're poor, and you're suffering, even, even though at that point it becomes very hard for us to rejoice, <coughs> the Bible calls us to do just that. <coughs> The Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, Be joyful always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then that was the revelation of Habakkuk. The key is this. You praise God for who he is and not just for what he does. You, you praise God for what he's done and not just for what he's doing. And that's where Habakkuk goes. He moves back into the zone and he says, I will rejoice because of who God is and what he's already done. And the reason why is this. Because now he's closer to God. Because now he trusts him by faith. And because now he says in the verse, at the end of verse 18, he says, I'll be joyful in my God. And God my what? And God my Savior. You see, because if God never did another thing for you other than, other than to send his son Jesus Christ and die for your sins and rise again, you would have enough to sing about forever. See, Jesus is enough to sing about forever. Because Jesus has done enough yesterday 
to trust him with all your tomorrows. Check out this last verse, verse 19. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. So what Habakkuk is saying here in this last chapter, last verse of this last chapter, <clears throat> he says, even though I've had a chapter one type of question, even though I've had a chapter two kind of waiting, today I've got a chapter three kind of faith. And even though the fig tree doesn't bud and there are no animals in the barn, the Lord is still in his holy temple and the righteous will live by faith. God's word will be true. I'll find my strength and my hope in the Lord my God. He will take me to new heights. Habakkuk says, I'll be joyful in God my Savior. Because that mountain that once seemed overwhelming, that mountain that was so intimidating, is no longer. Habakkuk says, my, my God enables me to go on the heights. I climb to the heights and I stand above it all. <coughs> I can see what God sees, and I love what God loves, and I hate what God hates. God enables me to rise above it all. And you see, that's what faith does. Faith sees the strong hand of God and the promise of God. Faith sees the provision of God, not the circumstances of life, and it climbs above them all. That's why Habakkuk can worship God. <coughs> He trusts him and he anticipates him showing up in a big way. I pray that as we close that each one of us would end up where Habakkuk is. That we'd end up where Habakkuk ends. That we would leave this building of faith. Trusting Jesus as our God, dead, buried, and raised for our sins. That we would leave here with a song on our lips celebrating all that God has done for us as a people. And that we would live each day with a sense of expectancy, anticipating and waiting patiently for God to show up in a big way. And that he would show up. And that, that he would deal with sin. And that in his great mercy, he would save people. That's our prayer. As Habakkuk says, I stand in all of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, Remember mercy. I pray that we would move. We would see a great move of God in our day. That we would see revival. And that we would see it transform this nation. Let's pray together. Father God, we do, we do love you. We thank you so much for providing for us. We thank you, God, that this room is filled with people with stories of, of how they met you and had sins forgiven, how their lives have been transformed, how they've developed friendships, and Lord, all the glorious things that you've done. And God, we confess right now, if we, we told all the stories of your provision in our lives, even if you never did another thing that we'd have enough to sing about forever. Lord, thank you for ministering to us through this book. I pray that at this moment we would follow you like Habakkuk, that we would remember your goodness, your promises, even ex expecting those things that we've been dealt. But above all, that we never let go of you, just trusting and believing, knowing that you're still on the throne, that all things are possible with you, and knowing that as we cling to you and embrace you, that you will reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name, amen.